number of verses from verse 19, please. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now, Paul is writing here, and as a very familiar passage to us, and from verse 19 it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law or outside of the law is manifested, being witnessed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Amen. We pray that God will bless His Word to our hearts once again this evening. Give us understanding of it. Can I just say it has been great to be with you today. Uh, it's been lovely to have fellowship with you. I want to thank Raymond and Avril and the family. Let me get this right now. Rachel, Sarah, and James. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your hospitality today. It's been great to be with you all. I've thoroughly enjoyed the time spent with you. And you know something? You've made me feel even more welcome today. See that second hymn, I Have a Shepherd? We sang that hymn at my baptism. We sang it at my wedding. We sang it at my farewell from Monkstown, and we sang it at our induction into Coke. So it was a very special hymn to us. And then Victoria sang that beautiful song, He Hideth My Soul in the Cleft of the Rock. And that again is one of my favorite songs. So thank you so much for that. But as we come to the Word of God this evening, we have a very serious question to ask. Because as we read down through this passage here, you'll notice that there's one topic that is the central theme of this passage, and it's the topic of the law. And I want to ask the question this evening, what about the commandments and good works? Just over a year ago, I had a conversation with two young men from America. Now, I bumped into them in the street in Coleraine, and uh, I was in a bit of a hurry, but I saw what badges they had on, and I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation. So I stopped, and I could see the badge. It said, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known to us, of course, as the Mormons. Now, throughout the conversation, I kept trying to emphasize the need to repent of sin and to trust in Christ Jesus alone for salvation from sin. And as is often the case in encounters like this, one man was pleasant and respectful, while the other was more argumentative and, quite honestly, sometimes a wee bit sarcastic. And it made it very difficult to make any progress. And eventually this more argumentative man resorted to repeating one question over and over again in spite of receiving an answer. And his question was this, do you have to keep the commandments? Now, I knew what he was getting at. I knew what he wanted to hear from me so that he could just jump on it and try to give his opinion. What he wanted was a one-word answer, but his question do you have to keep the commandments? It can't be answered with just one word without causing a false understanding of what the Bible says. Tonight, I want us to answer that question. What about the commandment 
and good works. What about this question? Do you have to keep the commandments? I want you to see, first of all, this evening, the failure of the law. The failure of the law. Look at verse 20 that we read. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. The failure of the law. You see, the question I was asked was the wrong question. The important question isn't, do you have to keep the commandments? Because that question assumes that the keeping the commandments has some kind of worth with regards to salvation. People assume that keeping the commandments gain, gains them some sort of favor with God, that God might accept them into heaven or that God might accept them as being holy, or that God might be pleased to give them something good in return for them keeping the commandments and doing something that He approves of. But the fact is that the law has limitations. Good works and keeping the commandments has its limitations. Later on in the book of Romans, Paul writes in Romans 8 and 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. There's things that the law can't do. There's things that the law is too weak to do because the flesh is weak. The law is only as effective as the person who is expected to keep it. We are all born in sin. We are shaped or formed in iniquity. Before we were ever known by human eyes, our flesh was already tainted by sin. That sinful flesh can't keep a perfect record when it comes to keeping the commandments. Folks, if we were to, to depend upon the law to make us acceptable to our God, the weakness of our own flesh because of sin makes the commandments weak in us. It makes them unacceptable. The law itself is good, it's right, but the law itself has no power to make you a better person. There's no law in this world that can make you a better person. There, there's no law that can make you love me. And so we need laws to stop you from murdering me. Not that I hope anybody here has that intention. But we have those laws to stop us from doing that which is evil, to stop us from doing that which is bad. The law imposes limits for our benefit. And while human laws are sometimes unethical or downright immoral at times, God's laws are morally perfect. We talk about God's moral law as contained within the Ten Commandments. And that's the idea in Romans 7 and 12 where it says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. God's law is holy. And your response to God's law will determine what kind of a person you will become. But your response is marred by sin. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has kept the law perfectly. In Hebrews 4 and 14, we see those lovely words, saying then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Only the Lord Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly. He had no sin and because of that, and because He is God, because He is already perfect, He kept the law perfectly. Folks, we're born with sin. You're born with sin. And so it's impossible for us to keep the law perfectly. Every one of us falls short. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Folks, God will never allow any trace of sin, any spot of sin, any imperfection into heaven. And even if God were to forgive us our sin, you know something, that wouldn't be sufficient to give us access to heaven. Because forgiveness doesn't erase the memory of what we once were. We need more than forgiveness. We need more than forgiveness. What we need is justification. We need to be declared not guilty, not acquitted. We don't need to be pardoned. 
What we need is justification. When, the law, when God's law, when God Himself looks at us, we need God to look at us and not see any trace or memory of sin in us. And that's what justification does. Cleanses us so thoroughly that there's not even a memory of sin before God. The law cannot give us justification. And that's why it says here in verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you can try to keep God's law to the best of your ability, but it can't change the fact that you are an imperfect, law-breaking sinner before God. It doesn't justify you in the sight of God. You may be a better person than most. You may even be a better person than many professing Christians. And I've heard that over and over again from other unsafe people. But no matter how good you are, your goodness is tainted and marred by the sin you were born with. That righteousness that you're depending on so much, it's offensive to God because it's not a perfect righteousness. You might say, well, that's a bit unfair because nobody's perfect. But that's who God is. And God will only allow any, anybody into heaven who has the same righteousness as Him. And we can't dredge that righteousness up from within us, so it needs to be given to us. We need to be given a righteousness that God will accept. And that righteousness is from the Lord Jesus Christ. So if the commandments aren't good enough to make you right with God, then why did God give us the commandments? What is the function of the law? Well, again in verse 20 it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The first function of the law is to show us our sin. Romans 7 and 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The only reason why we know that we have sinned is because the law tells us what's right. It tells us what we shouldn't do, and we know we've done it. It tells us how we're not meant to live, and we know we've lived it. That's what the law shows us. God has given you and every person born into this world a conscience. That word conscience means with knowledge. You know something? When we sin, we sin in the knowledge that it's wrong. We know that it's wrong, but we do it anyway. We sin, and that's what our conscience tells us. Romans 2 tells us, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. That doesn't mean they can just do whatever they like. It means that they have the law within themselves. They have the law written on their hearts. They know what's right and wrong. They are moral creatures. We are all moral creatures. Let me tell you something, that's one of the best proofs against evolution. Because evolution can't create a moral being. God has made us that way. And because we have that, it says here in Romans 2 and 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. God, Paul calls this conscience the law written in their hearts. And this is a God-given instinct of what is morally right and wrong. It's why all around the world, murder, theft, rape, and other such sins are considered crimes because they are morally wrong and we have God's moral law written in our hearts. Man is a moral creature, but there's a problem with this. You see, through personal rebellion and the influence of an amoral, godless society upon us, our sense of morality can become warped. And our conscience can become desensitized. I heard of a man once who was involved in quite a bad motor accident where he was thrown from the car, and he ended up sliding down the road on his back. Now, the friction between him and the road tore his clothes to shreds, and he ended up sliding along his bare back and ended up with third-degree burns. On his back. Now, as a result of that, once the burns healed, his back was covered with scar tissue, but he had burned 
the ends of the pain receptors, the, the pain nerves in his back. So he has no sensation in his back anymore. It's been seared. And there's no sensation there anymore. In 1 Timothy 4 and 2, Paul speaks of those who have their conscience seared with a hot iron. They have a desensitized conscience. I wonder if you have a desensitized conscience. Are there things that you do now that you would never have done whenever you were younger? Are things that you do now that you wouldn't have done when your parents were around because you didn't want to bring shame to them, but now your conscience has become desensitized and you have no problem doing them anymore? You've put God's morality on the back burner. Our conscience may be a good starting point, but we can sear our conscience so it becomes numb to sin. We can also deceive ourselves to adopt our own kind of morality. In Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Proverbs 12, 20 says, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. In other words, they know that what they're doing is wrong, but they have deceived themselves into thinking that it's okay. And so we have people going around today saying that good is evil and evil is good. People going around today saying that morality is old-fashioned and quaint. Saying today that biblical standards are Victorian and out of date. A load of nonsense. Because God's law never changes. In the time of the judges of Israel, we're told that the people of Israel did that which was right in their own eyes. Not that which was wrong in their own eyes. They did that which was right in their own eyes. They did what they thought was right. Didn't matter what God said. If they thought it was right, they did it. In other words, if it feels good, do it. Where have you heard that before? Is that not what we're being told in society? Just do whatever feels good. If it feels good, well, then it can't be doing anybody else any harm. It must be okay then. That's a nonsense because your heart is deceitful. It tells you lies. Why? Because it's corrupted by sin. We have no idea what true morality is without the law of God. And it's God's law that shows us what the truth is. Today in society, there's no such thing as moral absolutes. We're told that it's wrong to tell somebody that they're wrong. I don't know whether that's irony or just plain hypocrisy. We're told that it's wrong to tell someone they're wrong. But God has given us an objective measure. In the Word of God, and we have something given by God which tells us clearly and without the need for any subjective interpretation what's right and what's wrong. God says, Thou shalt not murder. And the Lord Jesus said, He who hates his brother without a cause is guilty of murder. And so when we harbor hate in our hearts, we are in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that we have committed sin because God's law, the Bible tells us. God says, I shall not bear false witness. And so when we act hypocritically, or when we don't reveal everything that we should on our tax returns, we know that it's sin because God's law, the Bible tells us it is. Is there anything in your life more important to you than God? If you have postponed getting saved because there's something else you want to do, something else you want to get, then God is not most important to you and you've broken the first commandment. You're already a sinner. Are you motivated by money or respect from others or by comfort or personal satisfaction or by pleasure? That motivation is an idol to you and you're guilty of breaking the second commandment. Have you ever promised God, God, when I get such and such an amount of money in the bank or whenever I retire or when I've paid off the mortgage, I'll get right with you and yet you've accomplished what you've said and you still haven't given your life to the Lord. You're guilty of taking God's name in vain. You called Him by name. You made Him a promise, but you haven't kept your word. You lied to God, and you've broken the third and the ninth commandments. Have you kept one day and seven aside each week to think about the Lord? Is, is there one day out of the seven that you put aside your entertainment, and you put aside your work, and you put aside uh, uh, everything else, 
and you think about God and your personal relationship with Him, if not, then you've broken the fourth commandment. You're a sinner before God. That's only a few of the commandments, but they point to you and they pierce your heart and they tell you and accuse you that you have sinned before an almighty God. And as a result, the law reveals you're guilty. You may be good before other people, but before God you're guilty. Verse 19 of our reading says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that's us, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law is there to show us our sin. Second function of the law, the law is there to bring us to Christ. It's there to bring us to Christ. Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now, there's no point in knowing about the problem if you aren't told where to find the answer to the problem. Praise God, that's what the gospel is all about. Good news. There has to be bad news for the good news to be good. I've told you what the bad news is, but the good news is there's a solution, and that solution is Christ. But how does the law bring us to Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ Himself said in Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And folks, Christ fulfilled the law in its entirety. Every single point of law He perfectly kept. He was perfect in His morality. He was perfect in His ethics. He, he was perfect in His attitudes, in His relationships, and in His obedience. I didn't think of the Lord Jesus Christ being obedient to anybody if He's God. He was obedient to the Father. He was perfect in every way. He came by taking on human flesh, never ceasing to be God, but He veiled His deity, and as a man, He lived a perfect life. And then as a man, He took our place as a perfect sacrifice with neither spot nor moral blemish, and He bore the wrath for sin that we deserve. He fully satisfied God's law, and the Bible calls that propitiation. Verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Because of what He did on Calvary, because of the perfect life that He led, He was the perfect sacrifice that God was willing to accept. And if we put our trust in Him, there's an answer to the solution, an answer to the problem that is our sin. If we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of our sin. And that's the way that sinners like you and me get back to God. But the only way is through Christ. I can remember a number of years ago uh, in Monkstown, we had a men's outing. Now, here's an idea for you men. If you want a men's outing, you know where our men's outing was away to? Bristol. I'll tell you, that's a proper men's outing. <laughs> Went to Bristol. And for lunch, we went to a wee pizza place, and we took over the whole top floor of the pizza place. But do you know where we went to? We went to Wesley's Chapel in Bristol. And in Wesley's Chapel, we were up at the front. Now, I couldn't remember before tonight. I was having, trying to think what it was, but we as a men's group just stood at the front of the church. And without any music or anything, we started singing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, Charles Wesley's song. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. You know what one of the verses says? It says, He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avails for me. And we had all the parts going and everything else. And there were two men standing towards the back of Wesley's chapel. We were singing one of Charles Wesley's songs in the church that John Wesley preached in. There were two men standing towards the back, and the tears were tripping them. These two men were caretakers for Wesley's Chapel. They came up to us after we finished singing and they said, Man, thank you so much for that. It's been years since we've heard that song in this, in this building. I thought that was so sad. What wonderful words. That Jesus Christ is the one that can set the prisoner free and set us free from sin. He's the only answer that there is to the problem of our sin because the law cannot show you the way to heaven, but Jesus Christ can because He kept the law perfectly. The law was given to show you that the only one who ever succeeded morally 
is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your only hope. The law doesn't save you. It condemns you. In Romans 8 and 2, Paul calls it the law of sin and death. See, all the law has for us is the revelation of our sin and the condemnation that we are under as a result. You know, there's, have you ever heard of the law of the mother-in-law? Now, you that are mothers-in-law, don't be getting too concerned. There's the law of the mother-in-law. You know what it is? The law of the mother-in-law is that the mother-in-law has the right to put any number of desserts in front of her son-in-law that she wants and then blame the son-in-law whenever he puts on weight. I have experienced the law of the mother-in-law a number of times, as you can tell. It's a wee bit bigger today. <laughs> Thank you, Avril. <laughs> That's the law of the mother-in-law. There's a consequence written into the law that if the mother-in-law puts desserts in front of you and you eat them, you're going to get bigger. There's consequences written into the laws of the land. If we go flying down the road there and break the speed limit and get caught, you shouldn't be doing it anyway whether you're going to get caught or not. But if you do and you get caught, you can expect three points in your license, a 60-pound fine, and perhaps up to a 1,000 pounds if it goes to court. Well, God has written the penalty for breaking His law into the Bible. For the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The reason why we die is because we were born in sin and because we're guilty. God's law finds us guilty. The penalty is eternal death, an ongoing, never-ending death in the lake of fire. And you may think that's harsh. But you have broken an eternal law set by an eternal God and the penalty needs to be an eternal penalty. God's only given us what we deserve. But I want to bring more good news to you. Verse 24, I want you to see the freedom from the law in verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace. Sorry, being justified by faith. Where am I? Therefore, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely by His grace. What is grace? God giving us what we don't deserve. My dear friend, tonight, if you're here and you're not saved, God wants you to be saved. Did you know that hell and the lake of fire was not created for human beings? The Bible tells us that it was created for the devil and his angels. You know what that tells me? It tells me that God doesn't want any human being ending up there. God didn't create any human being to end up in hell because that's not what it was created for. God wants you to be saved, even though you don't deserve it. Even though you're a sinner, God wants you to be saved. He wants you to come to Him and give your life to Him. In Romans 5 and 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me return to that question that that Mormon missionary asked me. Do you need to keep the commandments? Like I said, there's no yes or no answer. First, it's impossible to keep the commandments. Second, it's insufficient to keep the commandments. In order to get salvation, in order to keep salvation, the commandments aren't sufficient. You don't need to keep the commandments to be saved because your sin prevents you from keeping them perfectly as you would need to do. Even the commandments you do keep are tainted by your sin and they're unacceptable to God. The commandments have no power to save you or to keep you to be saved. All you can do and all you need to do is to repent of your sin and to put all of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for you. You need to be willing to admit that you're a sinner before God and turn from that sin and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I told him that, this Mormon missionary got very sarcastic and he said, oh great, I can do whatever I want. Completely misunderstood the purpose of God's law. The law was given to show us God's holiness. It was given to show us our sinfulness. It was given to show us sin's destructiveness. And it was given to show us Christ's righteousness. The law and the good works associated with keeping it 
cannot save your soul. You need to come to Christ. What you need is God's righteousness instead of your own. In verse 22, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Do you know what that verse means? The righteousness which is, which is, of, which is by, of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. Do you know what that means? It means the gospel's for everybody, without exception. The gospel is for everybody. If you're a sinner, and we all are, the gospel is for you. But it says here that it only comes upon all them that believe. I can preach to you about salvation. That's preaching unto all. But only those who accept that salvation will have it come upon them. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is an undeserved yet free offer of salvation. And you need to be willing to accept it if you're going to be saved. You know that the Holy Spirit and the believer is called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus as opposed to the law of sin and death. Now you have a choice. And God gave His people a choice once. He said to them, I set before you life and death. He says, now choose life. Choose life. Victoria was singing a song called The Decision. It was reminding you that you're going to need to make a decision tonight, and you will make a decision. Whether you want to make a decision or not is irrelevant because there is only two choices. You can leave this building this evening with Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, your sins forgiven, no longer bound by the law, but serving God out of a clean heart, a pure heart that He has cleaned. Or you can leave this building with your sin hanging around your neck. You can either have your, leave with your sin away or you can leave with your sin around you, but you can't go any other way. And you're going to make a decision right now before you even get to those doors. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What are you going to do with your sin? Are you going to give it up? Are you going to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? When we come to a gospel meeting such as this, you may have certain people in your mind, maybe friends, loved ones, neighbors, or colleagues. Maybe somebody who comes week after week, I don't know. This is the advantage of coming as a guest speaker. I don't know who's here. I don't know who's saved and who's not. Maybe you have certain people in your mind and maybe you're here tonight and you know that you're not saved. You know that you need to be. And Well, you can come to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. You can turn from your sin. You can put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be saved tonight. Forgetting about trying to work your way to heaven. Because the law can't bring you there. Only the Savior can. And you can give your life to the Lord Jesus tonight. But you know, over these last couple of years, especially... I've had a burden for those who I have come to know as the unsaved evangelicals. Those people who have been brought up in an evangelical church, a church that preaches the gospel and is sound in the Word of God. Perhaps you made a profession as a child or maybe as a teenager. Perhaps you once enjoyed the services and the singing and meeting with other Christians. Maybe you still like the atmosphere in a church. You don't like to miss it. You may even be involved in some kind of service or ministry. And yet, you're never compelled to respond to God's Word as it's preached. 
A message is preached that challenges you to make some change in your life or to do something different so that you're more in line with what God desires. And you're never moved, never compelled to change. You've never been convicted about your private time with the Lord. You've never been burdened to share the Lord Jesus Christ with someone who's lost. You have no desire to ever remain to remember the Lord Jesus Christ around the breaking of bread. You enjoy the songs, but their message doesn't thrill your heart. You never get excited or thankful about salvation. Now, none of these things can save you, but all of these things should be present in the person who is already saved. Let me ask you very sincerely, with all the love of my heart, do you really think that that kind of living is the life of someone who's indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God? Do you really think that His presence within you would have so little impact on your life? And if the Holy Spirit isn't in you, can you really say that you're saved? Is God's law revealing sin to you? Is it causing you to see yourself in a way you've never known before? You may think of yourself as a backslider, but a backslider is never content to remain the way they are. A backslider is the most unhappy person on the planet of earth. Could it be that you aren't really and truly saved? You may have just realized, as God has been speaking to your heart, that you're not saved. You may have just realized that you've been fooling yourself. Your heart has been deceiving you all these years. You've been going through the motions. You've been keeping the commandments as best as you can, doing the best that you can. But your heart's not right with God. You might think to yourself, well, now, if I got saved now, all these people who think I'm already saved, they're, they're going to be looking at me and they're going to be thinking I'm very strange. They're going to be very disappointed in me. I couldn't live with that embarrassment. Let me tell you something. See the people that are truly saved? If you were to tell them that you've been living a lie all these years, but you've realized the truth tonight and you've asked the Lord Jesus Christ into your life for real, those people that are truly saved will love you with such love you've never known before. They'll take you under their wing and they'll care for you, they'll look after you, they'll do everything that they can to make sure that you're walking with the Lord. I want to be available for you afterwards. I'll stay as long as it takes. If that means me going home at four o'clock in the morning, so be it. Sure, the roads are clear at that time, aren't they? If I can help you in any way, I will. Has God been speaking to your heart and you want to speak? Say to me at the door, I need to speak to you. Or stay in your pew. And if you're staying in your pew, those of you that are deacons, would you go to them and ask them, do you want the pastor to speak to you? And they'll come and get me. And if necessary, I'll leave the door and I'll come and speak to you straight away. But if God has been speaking to your heart tonight, you know you need to get right, get right with God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can do it. Could we sing a couple of verses just please, of 230 as we close?